Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. We have some uh, people trickling in, so there uh, there might be some some additions here late. But uh, welcome. We're glad you could join us for the second edition of our our weekly lunch and learn series. This week we have Dr. Ebony Murrell who's going to be presenting. Uh, before we get into that, I kind of want to get into a little bit of the background on how the the layout of the webinar is going to work. Um, as you probably all noticed by now, uh, we will be muting all participants just to um, allow Ebony to kind of have the full control of her presentation. Um, so don't worry, we still want to encourage all sorts of audience participation and uh, we encourage you to use the question or the uh, chat uh, dialogue box for any questions you might have throughout the presentation. Uh, you can send those directly to me. My name is Will Schneider and I can, at the conclusion of Ebony's talk, uh, kind of facilitate a Q&A with those questions. And so uh, we just ask that you Try and stick to the subject matter as much as you can, and we'll do our best to get through get through all of those. Um, but without further ado, we'll get started. Um, so today's presenter is Dr. Ebony Murrell, who leads our Crop Protection Ecology Program. Ebony is a native of Illinois, where she grew up in the small town of Assumption. Uh, she earned her BS in biology from Illinois, Illinois Wesleyan University, and from there went on to Illinois State where she earned both a Master's of Science and a PhD in biology. Uh, there she studied the ecological succession in mosquito communities. And from there she went on to become a postdoc first at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and then at Penn State. And as a postdoc she became involved uh, with agroecology and began to really fall in love with the idea that farmers can and do use uh, ecological concepts to manage both soil and pests and crop productivity. So after several years at Penn State, she joined the Land Institute in 2018 to launch our Crop Protection and Ecology Program where she serves as the lead scientist. So with all that, I'm going to turn it over to Ebony. All right, uh, thank you very much, Will. And let's see if I can share my screen successfully. Uh, all righty, so yes. Okay, there we go. Um, so yeah, thank, I want to thank everybody who's on today for uh, joining me. And I'll be discussing with you the research that we do here in the Crop Protection Ecology Lab. And when I speak of crop protection ecology, I mean the ecology both of and in perennial grains. So my agroecological research is driven by two major scientific passions, a love of insects and a love of diversity. Insects aren't just pests. There are, are many beneficial insects out there, predators and pollinators, that we rely on to help keep pests down and to help crops reproduce. So more and more we're learning that diversity in cropping systems is good as well. Um, diversity of microbes in the soil, diversity of plants, and diversity of insects. My goal is to research and apply knowledge about both insects and diversity in ways that will both optimize crop productivity in our perennial grain systems, while at the same time promoting healthy ecosystems. So to achieve this goal, the research in my lab centers around two main questions. The first is, how can perennial crops protect ecological resources? And the second is, how can we protect our perennial grains themselves using ecological practices? Let's break that first question down into a little more detail. How can perennial crops help promote ecological resources? The major advantage of a perennial crop versus an annual crop is that you don't have to replant it every year. If you don't have to replant, that means you're not tilling the soil, which reduces soil erosion. Not only that, but the much deeper root mass of perennial plants helps to build organic matter in the soil and thus build the soil itself over time. This is one of the central reasons for the Land Institute developing perennial grains. What may not be quite as obvious is that perennial plants are also excellent at promoting and maintaining ecological diversity. In the soil, perennials help promote diverse microbial communities over time. Many perennial species are particularly good at increasing arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF. These AMF form a symbiotic relationship with plant roots, so they help the plant to take up water and minerals, and then the plant in turn provides the AMF with other essential nutrients that it can't produce on its own. Above ground, the lack of tillage in perennial systems provides a more permanent habitat for beneficial arthropods to thrive. Natural enemies of insect pests, uh, like this lovely wolf spider here, 
uh, can build their populations in these less disturbed habitats and help keep pest insect abundances low. And if the perennial plant flowers, as several of our crops do, then those flowers provide an excellent resource for pollinators. Pollinator health is a big concern these days, and most of our food relies on or benefits from pollinators. So any crop that the Land Institute can develop that will help pollinators could ultimately benefit not just the pollinators, but also our food supply. So what I've described are the benefits that perennials provide in general, but what we don't yet know is how our perennial grains specifically compare to other perennial species in terms of the services that they provide. So studying this is a major research goal of the Crop Protection Ecology Lab. One example of this research is the collaborative project we're conducting uh, with the people in the Kansas State Entomology Department. Uh, Drs. Tanya Kim and Brian Spiesman, and Tanya's master student, Jess Butters. For this project, we've established plantings in Kansas of five of our perennial grain candidates, plus a planting of a nine species prairie mixture. We're evaluating how these different plantings compare in terms of the natural enemies that they attract, the pollinators that they attract, and also the forage quality of the crops that the crops can provide. This project is only beginning its second year, but we've noticed a couple of cool results already. One is that most of our perennial grains provide better forage quality than the nine species prairie mixture, which is something to consider if a farmer wants to plant these perennials either within their crop fields or as border crops to their current crop fields. The second is that both cup plant and sylphium, these yellow flowers here, attracted just as many pollinators as the nine species prairie mixture. So planting these perennial grain candidates widely could really benefit pollinator communities. Now that study was conducted in Kansas where our perennial crops are either native or have been established in the landscape for some time. However, we don't know how the effects of our perennial crops on the environment may change if they're introduced to a new area. To test this, the CPE technician, Eddie Sheremon, is conducting a study both here in Kansas and in Trelu, Argentina, with our collaborators there, Alejandro Vilela and Damian Rovetta. Eddie is studying uh, bee communities in both locations, uh, in sylphium fields, which is our perennial sunflower, alfalfa fields, and fields of flowers that are native at each location. We're particularly interested in whether any of these crops cause a shift in the numbers of social bees, like honeybees and bumblebees, versus smaller solitary bees. Solitary bees are the unsung heroes of pollination, so they're often hard to see, as you can see from this photo of pin specimens over here, but they do a lot of the work. In Kansas, we know that our crops attract more solitary than social bees, but we don't know if the same holds true in an international location. Um, so now, thanks to the shutdown, Eddie is currently identifying his bee specimens in his apartment, so we don't have results for that study quite yet. Uh, but we will soon, so stay tuned. Looking at the below ground services is our research uh, resident, Alex Griffin. Her approach is a little different in that she's interested in whether the service our crop pro uh, provides depends on its genetic origins. She has looked at whether sylphium from drier areas like central Kansas to wetter areas like central Illinois vary in their ability to take up AMF, the beneficial fungus. She also compared this to some of our semi-domesticated sylphium, which is being bred and developed for oil seeds production. One of her findings has been that the plants from the east in Illinois harbor more AMF in their roots than do plants in the west. Also interesting is that the semi-domesticated plants, which were, um, pardon me, uh, so the sylphium uh, domesticated plants were uh, bred from plants that came from central and east Kansas, and she found that they actually have an intermediate amount of AMF in their roots. This is good news from a domestication perspective because it doesn't appear that breeding for more and larger seeds is necessarily causing the sylphium to lose its ability to form good associations with beneficial soil fungi. So all of these are examples of the research we do on the ecological services of, that our perennial grains provide. However, perennial grains themselves are not immune to pests. This leads us to the other question and main focus of our lab, 
which is how do we protect our perennial grains themselves using ecological practices. The first example I'll give is not actually a formal research project, but it's just some basic troubleshooting that we've done on our own breeding plots in Kansas. At the Land Institute, we're developing lines of perennial wheat and perennial sorghum. The pests you find in perennial wheat and sorghum are the same as those that you find in annual sorghum and annual wheat. And one of the big pests in Kansas are these uh, little bugs called chinch bugs. They're only about an eighth of an inch in size. They live in the wheat in the spring, and they don't do much damage there, even though they're feeding on the plants. But then when the wheat begins to dry out in June, these insects walk across the sorghum uh, walk across to the sorghum fields where they feed throughout the summer and cause massive damage. One strategy we used uh, to reduce this problem was to space the sorghum and wheat fields apart from each other and then in between those fields we planted a summer cover crop mixture of cowpea, buckwheat, and foxtail millet. Those plant species help to attract a lot of predators which can then eat the chinch bugs that try to walk through the field. Uh, by doing this, we have managed to reduce the chinch bug counts in our perennial sorghum fields. For other perennial grains, though, the solution isn't so simple. And a good example of that is our silphium plants, which are a native prairie species. They're fed on by a moth called Eucosma gigantiana, which we'll call Eucosma for short. So Eucosma is a specialist. It only feeds on silphium flowers and roots and nothing else. Here we have an interesting philosophical situation. If you think about it, pest is a very anthropocentric term. Uh, a pest is only a pest if it's somehow disrupting human lives or consuming something that we want to consume. So until we elected to domesticate silphium, Eucosma was merely a native insect feeding on a native plant. Now that we're trying to make silphium a crop, anything that causes major damage to it, even the native species like Eucosma, is now a pest. So this really creates a, a kind of a interesting situation because we don't want to get rid of Eucosma as a species and spraying the fields with a broad spectrum insecticide wouldn't be a good idea either. Uh, you remember that silphium attracts a lot of pollinators, so anything that we treated with that harmed the pollinators would sort of defeat the purpose of using silphium to promote ecological services. As an alternative uh, for managing Eucosma, Dr. Rob Morrison and his student Caitlin Ruiz from the USDA Research Facility in Manhattan, Kansas, are using chemical ecology to help reduce this pest instead. Caitlin and Rob are gathering Eucosma moths in the field and then testing the pheromones or natural chemicals that the moths submit. Each moth species emits a unique sex pheromone in order to attract each other and mate successfully. Once Caitlin and Rob can identify the sex pheromones for Eucosma, we can produce those pheromones ourselves in the lab. You can then use those produced pheromones to make pheromone traps that trap just the Eucosma moths or you can spray an entire field with the pheromones so that the moths become confused and have trouble finding each other to mate. If they don't mate, they won't, won't lay fertile eggs. And this is a process called mating disruption. Mating disruption and pheromone trapping have been successfully used in other perennial crops, such as fruit orchards and cranberry bogs. So we're very hopeful to be able to develop the same management technology for our silphium crops with the help of Robin Caitlin. The last example that I'll give is research on how below ground processes can be used to improve plant defenses above ground. This research is being conducted by the CPE postdoc, Dr. Chase Stratton. Um, so the plants that we grow produce natural chemical defenses against insects, such as the chemical jasmonic acid or JA as it's abbreviated here. Previous research has shown that plants that have more AMF, the beneficial fungus, in their roots actually produce more defenses when a caterpillar feeds on the plant. However, we don't know if it's just the presence of the AMF that increases defenses, if it's the increase in minerals that the AMF takes up for the plant, or if it's a combination of the two factors. So Chase has been conducting studies fertilizing our perennial sorghum plants he is also testing this with corn and annual sorghum, and either adding or excluding AMF fungi in the soil for the plants. Seeing how fertilizer and AMF interact with each other to affect plant defenses will help us to determine best practices for planting well-defended sorghum in the field. And it'll help us to determine whether we need to add AMF spores as a seed treatment, 
whether or not to fertilize, and if so, how much to be fertilized. So that I think gives kind of a general overview of the types of work that we do in the Crop Protection Ecology Lab. Um, I wanna thank you all very much for your attention up to this point, and I'd like to open the floor for the Q&A session. Okay, um, so we did have a couple great questions already come in through the chat box. Please uh, continue to send those in. Uh, like we said, we're gonna do our best to get to all of them, just try and keep it a little bit focused towards the subject matter that Ebony just presented on. Uh, Ebony, so the first question that came in was, uh, you touched on this a little bit, but the idea of integrated pest management, um, kind of what the philosophy is behind that and, and why that's our approach. That's an excellent question. Um, so if you look at the history of uh, pests and, and managing pests, um, when the Green Revolution came about and not long after that introduction of uh, wide-scale pesticide use, the, the original philosophy was pest control, right? We had these wonderful chemicals that you just, you know, dump on the landscape and just get rid of everything that's out there because bugs are bad. Um, that led to some rather serious uh, environmental problems. Uh, DDT, of course, is the prime, uh, the poster child for that, where just wide-scale spraying of the landscape led to a lot of uh, uh, degradative effects on the landscape. Um, so certainly that, that uh, brought about the ban of DDT, but more, you know, more than just DDT specifically, the shift has since changed from pest control to pest management. The difference in philosophy is that in pest management, you're not trying to get rid of everything. And that's, as you mentioned, that's kind of what I touched on with Eucosma. We don't want to get rid of Eucosma. We don't want it to go extinct. Um, first of all, that's just a bad idea. Uh, di diversity in general, I think, is good. Uh, um, in the landscape. But secondly, when you try to do that and you, you really try to hammer uh, an insect with an insecticide, if it doesn't have any other choice but to go extinct, it will evolve resistance. Um, and in fact, insects are fantastic at evolving resistance, some, uh, much faster than some other taxa are. Um, so the idea with integrated pest management is, is first off, you don't just go to chemicals as your first approach. Uh, the second thing is that you're employing a series of tactics, not just a single tactic, so that the insects can't evolve resistance to any one of those tactics that you're trying. So doing things like planting cover crops, you know, in order to prevent chinch bug movement, um, in order to bring in predators. That's one tactic, but that's not necessarily the only tactic. You may also want to uh, plant intercrops within your sorghum field to help manage those insects. You may want to use some kind of pheromone approach. If you can link all of those different tactics together, then you can reduce the populations to a point where you don't have to treat for with chemicals, or if you do, it's um, very infrequently. Okay, great. Um, another question is, does the measurement of pollinator numbers focus on total number of insects, amount of species, or both? Both. Both. Excellent question, yes. Uh, and, this, and going back to our pollinator study with uh, uh, our different perennial grain candidates versus prairie, we found that sylphium and cup plant matched up against prairie both in terms of uh, diversity uh, to genus, not to species of, of bees, but uh, genera of bees. They have the same amount of diversity and the same abundance. Fascinating. Okay. Um, another question was, what were some of the challenges of, of just assuming, given the background of your the crop protection ecology program only beginning in 2018, what were kind of some of the challenges of just launching a program to begin with? Uh, good question. Um, so there were several challenges. The first is that I was really not familiar with Kansas ecology. Uh, I had, you know, uh, Illinois was the farthest west I had ever lived. So it, it was it was different coming here and just learning that there are different weeds and different insects that you're dealing with, even though many of the, the plant species are very similar. Um, the second thing that was interesting was uh, trying to get everybody behind the idea of, uh, well, not, not behind the idea of IPM. I mean, they, they, you know, being the Land Institute, people were behind that, but they didn't, they had never really worked with it as, as intimately as I had. So, um, 
it, it was not an, a, uncommon at all when I first came here that, that every week somebody was running in and dumping a bug on my desk and they're like, what is this? And I'm like, it's a caterpillar. Like, <laughs> and, uh, and they're like, but what species? And I don't know. <laughs> so that, that was a fun challenge. And then trying to convince them that, okay, you found this caterpillar on your plant, but do you actually know if it was eating your plant or not? Let, let's take a little more, a little closer look at that. Um, so that was a fun challenge, uh, but, but we're, uh, I think we've got a, a lot of converts now. We got a lot of people on board and, and certainly there are people helping me to count pests in the field. Um, the, the people I work with have gotten a lot better at being extra sets of eyes and saying, hey, we spotted this and, and what can we do? Um, yeah, but I, I mean, it, it's been a fun challenge. Um, the, it's sometimes a little intimidating to not know anything about the system until you realize that nobody else knows anything about the system either, you know, like we're, we really are the first uh, in some ways. So um, uh, it, it does make for some challenges sometimes in, in trying to figure out how, how the system works. But then whenever you do make a discovery, you, you really feel a great sense of accomplishment. That's right, always learning. Yeah. Um, another question, are, are when you're selecting, or I guess uh, speaking for our plant breeders, are we selecting for resistance to pests? Um, is that in our kind of consideration for breeding criteria? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that, that's another good question. I didn't touch on selection as much because I assume that Catherine, being the crop protection geneticist, probably talked about that a bit last week. Uh, but we are interested in that. Um, we have a PhD student at University of Minnesota, Kelsey Peterson, who is running a lot of bioassays on sylphium plants of different genotypes to try to assess their ability to resist uh, caterpillars, caterpillar damage. Uh, so she and Eddie, uh, our technician, are, are both working on that project and they've really made good progress with it. Um, we've also started to do some assays with uh, sorghum as well, or perennial sorghum, to try to identify certain genotypes that may be more resistant to pests. Great. Um, what would you say your five-year goals are, um, kind of in, from the research program perspective? You can, I guess you can take that, um, you know, focus on a single experiment or if you want to kind of talk across the board? Yeah, um, good question. Uh, I am, I have two, so I, I, I definitely have a lot of interest in sylphium just because it, it's a very buggy plant in the sense that it, it has pests, but it also has wonderful potential um, for beneficial insects also. So definitely within the next five years, I'm interested in, in helping to come up with some strategies for managing eucosma in the sylphium program, but also in uh, getting a better handle on the predator and pollinator services that sylphium can provide so we can start planting it out in the fields. I really think it has a great potential even now as a forage species, and then it will have a potential as an oilseed species as we continue to breed it. Um, but given the problems that we've been having with pollinators, uh, it, it stands, it only stands to reason that we should be getting this plant out there given the services that it provides now. And I think it can provide agronomic uh, benefit as well. So that's one of my major goals. The other uh, major goal I'm working on is figuring out intercropping solutions with our perennial grains. Um, so we're doing that um, We've done that a little bit with sorghum. Um, Brandon Schlautman, our uh, legume breeder, is very interested in what legumes can be intercropped, at, intercropped with Kernza. So I uh, will be working with him on that, uh, looking at the ecosystem services that you can find in those dual Kernza and uh, legume intercrop systems. And then we're also trying different intercrops with sylphium to see what grows there. Fantastic. Uh, okay, last question. What has been your most exciting recent discovery? Ooh, dear. I don't know. There's so many. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's a cheesy answer, but, um, hmm. So you can um, you can say more than one if that's the the easy. I I is it's it's so hard. Um, <laughs> 
I guess um, I would have to say that one of the big accomplishments that's happened in, in the lab in general, and this really happened uh, in, within the first year, was uh, Eddie being able to raise Eucosma all the way through its life cycle in the laboratory in the very first year he was here. And for people who don't raise insects for a living, which is the vast majority of the population, that doesn't sound like much, but when you have an insect, if you consider an insect, especially a moth, as a caterpillar, it does one thing, and then it pupates, and then it has to live through the pupil stage, and then as an adult, it eats something else, and, and then it has a whole mating behavior that you may or may not know anything about, it may have very specific requirements to mate uh, and lay eggs. And um, all of those things are extremely tricky. So for Eddie to be able to accomplish that in one year was incredible. Um, we're still troubleshooting. We haven't gotten to the point where we have like a, a continuous multi-generational colony, but uh, he's really made some amazing strides with that. And that gives me great hope for continuing to develop um, programs to manage Eucosma. That's great. And if, for all those uh, viewing, if you haven't yet seen, Eddie last week did a uh, technician takeover on our social media channels where he kind of walked through a, a day in the life of his role within Ebony's research program and talks a little bit about that process. And it's definitely a, a, a worthwhile view if that's of interest to you. Um, it's really Eddie's program. I'm just allowed to work. <laughs> <laughs> Teamwork. Um, but with that, that looks like all the questions we have. Uh, you all should have my email from uh, sending the Zoom details over. So please, if anything comes up for Ebony or about the Land of Student General, please feel free to reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to, to answer it for you or put you in touch with the, the person who can probably answer it a little bit better. Um, so please feel free to reach out and uh, be sure to follow us on our website or social media. We, we intend to do more of these uh, Lunch and Learn series and kind of other opportunities of engagement during this time where we're all in our our separate areas and, and going a little bit more online. So, so please uh, be sure to follow us there and, and stay, stay up to date on the latest. And other than that, uh, we hope you have a great rest of your week and uh, we look forward to another opportunity to engage. So one last time, thank you, Ebony. And uh, we, we hope you all have a nice day. Bye-bye.